Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Joel, I'm the teaching pastor here. If you're new to the church, you're probably wondering, who is that guy up there? I've been gone for the last few weeks, but I'm so glad to be back on home turf here. Uh, we actually got a chance to go to, well, we've been all over the place, but we got a chance to go to Guatemala, which is in Central America, and we went down to the jungle down there and visited some friends and had all sorts of fun. So uh, I actually heard a story about a guy that went down to the jungle and came back with a tropical disease, and he was you know, admitted to the hospital, and the doctor came in in a full hazmat suit and said to him, uh, you know, like just like full hazmat suit. He's like, hey, we've got some bad news for you. You have a really bad disease. And um, the guy was like, oh my gosh. He's like, well, what is it? And they're like, we, we really don't know. It's probably going to take about six months in this hospital for you. He said, six months? He said, yep, it's going to be about six months. And you're going to have to, you're going to, we're going to need you to live off of a diet of pizza and pancakes. And he said, pizza and pancakes, is that going to help my, my sickness, my diagnosis? And they're like, well, we, we don't really know, but that's all we're going to be able to slide under the door, man. So anyway, is that me? What am I doing wrong here? All right, does it work? Don't touch it. All right. Hey, we're going to be talking this morning about how to conquer fear. Thank you for that thunderous response. So uh, I decided this morning I better practice what I preached. Um, so a couple years ago, I played drums right before I spoke, and it did not go well. So I vowed to myself, I'm never going to drum and then preach. But then this morning, I saw those drums just calling out to me, and I was like, I got to do it. So I went in there, and I played drums, and I'm also a guy that likes to practice really hard before I play, and I, so I, I, anyways, I played drums this morning. So I did all that to set example for you guys, because I want to talk to you guys today about conquering fear, because how many of you know that right now we are surrounded by fear. Now, before I go anywhere on this talk, I want to first point out to you that when I say fear, I know that people don't like to acknowledge fear. I'm a counselor, I'm a trained professional, and I know people don't like to acknowledge fear. So there are certain words we use because we don't want to say fear. So when, when you hear me say, if you're like, well, I'm not afraid of anything, right? If you hear me say anxiety, that means fear. So if I say fear, fear and you're like thinking, I don't get afraid. Just use the word anxiety. Cool. If you say, well, I don't get fearful. I just get worried. A little bit worried. Same thing. When I say fear, just think in your mind when I have worry. Okay. He's talking about worry, worry. Okay. Some of you say, well, I just get a little nervous about what's going on in the world today. It's a little uncomfortable. You know, same thing. When I say fear, just think about, okay. Okay. When I get, you know, uncomfortable or, you know, a little bit nervous about what's going on in the world. Or if you just say, man, I'm just frustrated about what's going on in the world, maybe even angry, same thing. So let me just establish that at the start because I know a lot of people say, well, I don't get afraid. And some of you, it's because you've actually removed everything from your life that could potentially make you afraid and now you think you're safe. But I've got news for you. You're not. And this morning, you might say, well, Joel, who are you to talk about fear? You go out and do all those crazy adventure things. I mean, you're going to the jungle in Guatemala. And, and let me tell you something about me, okay? I have been, I have struggled with anxiety, fear, worry my entire life. In fact, it runs in my family. My grandfather and grandmother were horrible, just worry, anxiety. My mom, at one point as a kid, got so bad her anxiety, they almost checked her into a hospital. I just remember asking dad, is mom going to die? And he said, no, she's not going to die. She's just got a lot of anxiety. I've carried that with me for years. I've had anxiety. I've had fear. I've had anxiety to the point sometimes where like I literally just can't get up or go out of the house. And you guys, that's, you, a lot of people say, well, that's impossible. Like we've seen pictures of stuff you've done. Yeah. So I wanted to do something really quick just to show you that I get fear. Okay. So I started thinking back on some of my trips where I was the most afraid, okay? The first one I thought about was this trip that I took a few years ago, and my PowerPoint is not working. Hang on. The TV is off? (sighs) My greatest fear, something not working. Let's see if this works. Is it there? Is it there? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So, 
Is that a picture of me by a train? Yes. Okay, we're good. All right. So this is a, this is a trip I took a, a while back, and this is where we smuggled Bibles into communist China. Okay, so it's illegal in China to be a Christian that is not their kind of Christian, right? So you have pastors all over the country that are working off of one page of the Bible. They're pastoring thousands of people in house churches. They've never had a whole Bible. So we snuck these guys, these big study Bibles in for pastors to help them teach. Can you imagine that? Like if I just preach off the same sheet of the Bible every week, you guys would be like, we're done, man. Does he have another message? No, I don't. That's all the Bible I've got, right? So they have people that actually have that. So we would sneak Bibles in past the communist guards. We would put them in false bottom suitcases. It was all very cloak and dagger. And you see how happy I look here? I'm terrified. (laughs) Just terrified. I'm like, what if we get caught? What if my team gets caught? You know, what's going to happen, right? So we would, what we'd do is we'd get on these trains in groups of two and we would go to this border crossing and we would cross the border and take our bags with us and act like tourists and then bring the Bibles in. And then we'd store them in this hotel room we rented just on the other side of the border until we'd stockpiled enough. And then we would call a pastor and he would drive around in his truck. We'd shake his hand, drop the box of book. We called them books. You can't call them Bibles. We'd drop the books, Bible <laughs> in the back of the trunk and then he would drive off. I was terrified that whole time. And I did a trip like that. I've probably done seven trips like that, smuggling Bibles. We never got caught, thank goodness. But it was scary the whole time I was doing it. But I knew that there's something more important than my fear. So then one of the trips, we decided to go rappelling off the Great Wall of China. See how hardcore and happy I look? (laughs) And at ease? Terrified. What if the rope breaks? What if the government comes and says, you can't repel off our 5,000-year-old archaeological object. I was terrified, right? Then we decided to camp on the wall. Is that legal? Everybody asked, is that legal? I'm like, I'm not sure. But we did it. And it went great. But the whole time, that whole night, I was terrified. Anytime I'd see a light down here, I'd be like, oh no, it's the guards. They're coming to get us. They never came to get us. Can we get, like, can we fix this somehow? Is it possible? Or do I need to go to my dreaded, my worst fear, a handheld mic? (laughs) Anyways, trip, I'm terrified, okay? Here's another trip I did where I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. See how confident and in charge I look here? So the thing you don't realize is I climbed this mountain one time when I was in the best shape of my life and I got altitude sickness and I had to be rushed down the mountain about to die from acute mountain sickness. Here I'm about... I'm just right close to that point where I got sick last time. This is my second time trying to climb the mountain with these guys. And the problem this time is I was leading the team. So if I got sick, that's a real problem, right? Uh, And this guy's super famous. So uh, look look how large and in charge I look, right? Terrified. The whole time I'm like, Lord, help me not get sick. Don't let me get sick. Don't let me get sick. Don't let me get sick. And the thing with altitude sickness, it can just hit you at any time. You don't, you can be in the best shape of your life, but that altitude, if your body's like, I'm done today, You're going down and you're not getting better until you get down the mountain. Now, here's my point. I'm not showing all these, be like, look how cool I am. I've done all these chips. But here's what I know about you, okay? There are some things in your life right now that are standing in front of you that terrify you. For those of you that are like, didn't terrify me, that are making you a little bit worried, a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious. There are some things right now that are in front of you that you're going, man, I don't know if I don't want to address that one. For, for some of you, what it might be is, you know you need to come clean about that thing you've been doing, but if you go telling people, what are they going to think, right? What if you come clean about that addiction? What if you lose your job because of it? Man, I can't do it. And so what you're doing is you're living in lies. You're thinking you got everybody fooled. Nobody's fooled. But you're terrified and you're just living in this constant anxiety. What if somebody finds out? What if somebody finds out about that secret, right? Some of you, you've got some, an opportunity in front of you to improve your life situation. Maybe God has opened a door for you. Maybe a new business venture or something like that. But you're looking at it and you're going, what if I fail? What if I fail? You know, for me, the biggest fear I've ever had was this right here. Scared the heck out of me. Any men relate? That little thing. Remember, they give it to you, and they're like, all right, go home. You're like, 
somebody going to come with us and supervise us? No, take the kid home. Like, but, but who's going to supervise? No, you. You're the parent. You're the adult. Scary, scary, scary. And, and we've all got stuff like, maybe some of you right now, your, your fear is that. Like, man, I don't want to commit to having a kid. How, is, it, is it good to raise a kid in this crazy world? Is that fair to raise a kid in this whacked out world? My answer to that is yes. It's a great time to raise godly, righteous kids who shine like stars in the universe, okay? Maybe you're afraid to commit. Have you been dating that person for a long time? She keeps pushing you and pushing you and you feel the tension and stuff and you're just like, I don't know, man. The last one didn't work out very well. You're like, I'm, I don't know. My advice, pony up, bro. You got to beat your fears because here's what I've learned about fear. Fear does not go away. It just does not. It has to be faced in small doses. And as you expose yourself to the thing you fear in small doses, step by step moving towards it, it loses its grip on you. It doesn't go away. I'm always afraid before I do a trip. Ask my wife. I was freaking out right before we went to Guatemala, like really freaking out. She had to talk me off the ledge, man. I was freaking out, but I went, I realized that, you know what? It never goes away and it'll just torment you if you don't do the thing you fear. But if you do the thing you fear, you will often find that as you take the steps of faith, God comes through for you and you go, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I lead these trips all over the world. And um, one of the trips I lead is to Israel. And people would often send me this one question that just started to drive me crazy. So I put on the application form and they'd send me an email. They'd be like, hey, I got this question for you. And I knew what the question was. I'd be like, have you referred to the information packet? No, I have not. So I send them the information packet. The start of the information packet, here's what it says. It says this. Important, please read this entire page before you sign up for this trip. Here's some frequently asked questions I get. Is Israel safe? Here's my answer. Life is inherently dangerous. That means... Danger comes with the package. Because you will be alive while on this trip, that is a requirement to come with me, there is an element of risk involved. There are some steep downhill sections and the hike is challenging, not to mention politics. An Israeli friend of mine told me once, Israel is a peaceful nation. Everybody wants a piece of us. <laughs> Violence can erupt at any time in Israel. In the event of severe danger, we will cancel the trip. That said, millions of people visit Israel each year and come back to tell about it. Tourism is a cash cow, particularly in the area of Galilee where we will be hiking. So it's generally a peaceful area. Israeli peaceful. Do you get my joke? Israeli peaceful? Eh, anyways. Israeli peaceful? Anyways, it didn't work. People have written me nasty letters saying, why are you so sarcastic? I'm like, I'm not being sarcastic. I just, I can't afford to have cowards on the trip with me because it might get hard. And so I was actually going to name this message, life is too short to die a coward. But I thought that was way too hardcore. So we're going to call it instead, I heart fear. And I'll explain why in a minute. But the reality of this is you do not want to be hiking on a team with a bunch of pansies and cowards who run at the sign of any challenge. In fact, the most dangerous thing in the world is a cowardly person. You know, people are like, oh, what's dangerous is these big, powerful men. No, big, powerful men aren't dangerous. If you're worried about what big, powerful men will do, you should see what cowardly, weak men will do. Because it's cowardly, weak men that got to protect their territory. Cowardly, weak people that do dastardly. You know what dastardly means? It means cowardly. They do dastardly deeds. Remember Dick Dastardly, the character? Is that, that's like way back there. Some of y'all are like, huh, what? There was this cartoon character called Dick Dastardly, and he'd always do these underhanded things. <laughs> Cowardly people are dangerous, and you do not want to be around them. While we were in Guatemala a few weeks ago, we came upon a jungle turkey, which I didn't know was a thing. There's a jungle turkey. Beautiful turkey. And uh, as we walked up to it, my daughter and I walked right up to it, and he like walked up to us, and these, these guides, they were like, watch out for that turkey. That turkey will attack you. I'm like, a turkey attack me? What? So we were like taking pictures. As soon as we turn away from the turkey, the turkey goes to attack Elise. He's got these talons on the back. He's like, Wah. and I step in between him and shoo the turkey away. Man, if that turkey hadn't been protected species and people being around, I'd have been like, <laughs> but, but, but that made me think of that. You know, you know, 
Nothing is more dangerous than a turkey that has to protect their territory. And they turn on people, that the smallest one in the bunch, and go attack them because they're weak. Like, I'll take out that weak one because you're not big enough to go face the other one and head on. Cowards are horrible to be around. And listen, if you want to fly with the eagles, you can't go hanging around with turkeys. Turkeys are cowards. Turkeys are chickens. Wait, wait, no, that's not right. (laughs) But here's the thing, guys. A lot of what's going on in our world is a lot of decisions are being made by people who are living and making their decisions from fear. They're cowards, and then they're dangerous. And we as Christians don't get the luxury of being fearful. Because we're called to a higher, to something higher. Our hope for our security, for our sense of value, our hope for our our sense of empowerment does not come from anything this world can offer us. It comes from one source. We're going to look at a story of a guy today named Caleb. That's what this whole series has been about. A different spirit is about a guy named Caleb. And Caleb was one of the 12 spies that were sent by the children of Israel into Canaan to check out the promised land. So if you remember the children of Israel, they were in Egypt. God miraculously liberated them from Egypt through doing these amazing miracles, these plagues that he put on the Egyptians. Then as they're leaving, the Egyptians are like throwing wealth and riches upon them. And they're on this short, it's like a 30 day trip to where they were going. He opened the Red Sea for them and rescued them. All these miracles, right? just like a miraculous stuff. It's clear God is with them. And they get to the border of the promised land and they say, you 12 guys, go check out the land that God promised us and tell us what we're getting into. Well, they go in and here's the report of what happened. Caleb was one of these 12. It says, at the end of 40 days, the spies, they returned from spying out the land and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, hey, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. It's a good place, right? And this is its fruit. They basically showed them like, check out what this place produces. This is a great place. However, the people who dwell in the land, they are strong people. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And you're like, what the heck are Anak? Okay, this is something weird, right? There's this part in the Bible where it says that the sons, it's basically the angels came down and had relations with men and created a superhuman race called the Nephilim. You're like, that's in the Bible? Yeah, you need to read your Bible a little more closely. It's in there. There's some weird stuff in there. And so what these basically guys are saying is some of those giants are still hanging out there. They're like superhumans. We're dealing with a superhuman race. They're giants. We cannot take them. It's a bunch of supermans and we're going down. We have no kryptonite that we're going down, right? (laughs) They said, and not only that, the place is surrounded. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. That's the desert. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by sea and along the Jordan. They're freaking out. They're like, guys, this is impossible. There's no way this is going down. But one guy stood up and he quieted the people before Moses. And he said, let's go up at once and occupy it for we're able to dwell and overcome it. But here's what happens. The people freaked out. Caleb was surrounded by turkeys. And they're all like, we can't do it. We can't do it. And Caleb's like, no, we can do it. Do you remember what God did? No, we can't do it. And so they overpowered Caleb, the one courageous man. And then God speaks up. He's ticked. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people despise me? That's a heavy word, right? Like, have you ever despised someone? God says their lack of courage, not believing in me after all that I've done for you, is like despising me. How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've done among them? I'm going to strike them down with pestilence and disinherit them. And I'll make a new nation greater and mightier than they. God's like, I'm done. Let's just wipe them out and I'll start with you, Moses. Moses is like, whoa, hold up, God. Hold up, hold up. These are your people. And if you strike down your people because they're turkeys, people are going to go, well, what kind of God is he? And this is a weird part of the Bible too, where this Moses negotiates with God and God changes his mind. Go, what? God changes his mind. I don't get it, man. It messes with my theology. But Moses actually negotiates, and so God says, all right, fine, fine, fine. 
I've pardoned them according to your word. I'll let them off the hook, those turkeys. But truly, as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, basically saying, I'm going to get the earth filled with my glory without these, with these turkeys or without them. Okay. None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, all these people that have seen me split the Red Sea, save them out of the hand of Israel. He says, none of them, and yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice. None of them will see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. It's like, they're all out, a bunch of turkeys. They're all going to die in the desert. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But, but, there's one guy I saw. My servant Caleb, he has a different spirit. He's courageous in the middle of a bunch of cowards and has followed me fully and I will bring into the land in which he went and his descendants shall possess it. One act of courage allowed Caleb to reap the benefits that everyone else missed out on. And I believe this is an example for us because at any given time in history, you are going to be surrounded by fearful people. Fear is the primal emotion. It's the thing that drives people. It's the first thing Adam and Eve felt when they sinned. Fear. It says they were naked and afraid. It's like that TV show. It's where it came from. The Bible. They got afraid. And fear is such a primal and powerful emotion that I want to talk for a second about the power of fear. Because here's the thing. As somebody who's had anxiety before, oftentimes the fear we have is irrational fear. And we know it's irrational. Like when we look at the stats, people are like, oh, you know, the chances of you dying of this is so slim. It's like one in this. And you're like, yeah, but what if I'm the one? Somebody's got to be the one. What if I'm the one? And people that are rational will go, well, let me show you the data. And as one who has had irrational fear, I'm like, I don't freaking care about the data. What if I'm the one? And we get afraid. And the, 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 the thing with irrational fear is this. It's irrational. So rational, rationalizing won't talk you out of it. So I've had people like, well, let me show you the stats. On I don't care about the stats, man. If I could just stat my way out of it, I'd be Googling all day. I'm ter- the more I Google, the more terrified I get. Anybody relate? I see heads nodding. And this is where it's super important to understand something. There's only one thing that will drive out irrational fear. And it's something that's stronger than fear. And there's one thing stronger than fear. This is where 1 John, it says this. It says, God is love. Whoever abides, lives in love, lives in God. And God abides in him. And by this, love is perfected with us. So that we have confidence for the day of judgment. Like, wait, what? Huh? I'm going to talk about that in a second. What does that mean? Because as he is, so also are we in this world. And this is the important part. He says, there's no fear in love. When you're surrounded by God's love and you know it, you're fearless. There's no fear in love because perfect love, it says, drives out or casts out fear. The only way you're going to get a rational fear beat is not by giving yourself the stats. It's by surrendering yourself and realizing, God, no matter what I do, I will never get the security that I need. My spouse will never give it to me. My money will never give it to me. God, no matter what I do, I will never get the affirmation, the love I need, the appreciation from those around me. Never. God, no matter what I do, I'll never have the the, the empowerment that I feel I need. I only will get that from you. And so you surrender yourself and your ability to provide that for yourself or your spouse's ability to provide that for you. And you say, God, I'm counting on your love. and And that's what faith is. It's saying, I know that nothing in this world can provide me the security, the sense of connection with others, the relationships, the empowerment that I need. Only God's love can do that. And so I'm going to surrender my ability to do that. I'm going to walk in faith saying, were you courageous? Were you walking in my love and confidence knowing, man, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength, knowing that you can be persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. That's the ground you stand on. And that means you can, as I've heard it say, you can charge hell with a water pistol because you've got that kind of confidence. And that's the kind of confidence that stands out in our world today, guys. And we have to have it. We're surrounded by a bunch of turkeys. But we can
can show them how to turn into eagles. But we have to be confident. We do it humbly. And listen, there's this, uh, St. Anthony made this great quote. He's an Egyptian desert father. He said this. He said, a time is coming when people will go mad. And when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him saying, you are mad. You're not like us. today. Time is coming when people say, what is wrong with you? You should be afraid. And you're like, I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm being cautious and wise, but I'm not afraid because I know that first of all, my home isn't this, but second of all, I know I'm called to do something here and it's not hang out in my house, hold up in fear until this all blows over. That's what cowards do. And you be wise and don't be stupid. Don't be arrogant. No, I'm, you know, don't be a fool, but you be wise. But here's the thing. There comes a point where you got to stop Googling stuff because there's this thing called paralysis analysis, analysis paralysis, where you're like, I've looked at the facts and it's just too risky. Yeah, it's always going to be too risky because life is inherently dangerous. And if you're waiting for the perfect time when all this, everything is safe and lined up, you will be a turkey the rest of your life. And life's too short to die a coward. There's too much adventure out there that God has for you. There's too many great things he's put in you. You say, yeah, but Joel, are you telling me to be reckless? I'm not telling you to be reckless, but I'm telling you this. When you step out and do what God asks you to do, you don't have to come up with reckless, crazy things to do for God. He'll ask you to do things. Love that irritating family member. Speak up to your boss. Confront that person over here that you know you should confront. Step out and take that risk and go back to school whatever it is. And people are going to look at you and go, this is a really bad time to be doing that. Are you mad? And you're like, no, I'm not mad. I'm just being obedient. And they're going to think you're insane, but this is the quickest way to let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. As you walk in courage, you say, I'm not going to be afraid. And they're going to go, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm stepping out. And they're like, but you're insane. Are you not afraid? No, I'm afraid but I'm stepping out anyways. And you step out and you take a little step. And, and here's how it usually goes. You take a little step and you go, oh, wasn't, that wasn't that bad. I'm so glad I did that. I wish I would have done that earlier. And then you take another little step and you're like, oh, God never asked you to take steps that he hasn't prepared you for with his faithfulness beforehand. And, and listen, you may take a step and you may die. It'll be all fixed then. No need to worry anymore. but I don't think you're going to die. I've thought I was going to die many times. And look, I'm still here. Know this. You know, one of these days you might, you might hear Pastor Marcus might stand up here and say, hey, Joel died this week. And that'll be tragic. And it'll be tragic for my daughter. I think about that. You know, if she were to be left fatherless. But I would rather her die, I mean live, knowing that I died doing what God called me to do than me having lived being a coward as an example for her. I want my daughter to go, man, he went out in a blaze of glory. And I believe that's what God wants for all of us. And that's why he wants to infuse us with strength and love and courage. I, I get really passionate about this, you can tell, because I'm just so sick and tired of people being afraid. Be courageous, guys. And it's not because you're going to drum up the courage. It's because you're going to lean on the power the love of God persuaded neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities, things present, things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth. Nothing created in this world can keep you from the love of God. And that's the confidence you walk boldly into the night with. And as you walk into the night, you let your light shine and the night gets a little bit brighter because you're lighting up the world with his love shining through you. That's what we're called to do right now. We're not sitting around waiting for things to get better or get back to normal. Now is the time for us to be what we're called to be. You guys receive that? Yeah. All right, let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.